Um, thank you so much, and I'm uh, just delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Gene Kim, and you know, as has uh, been mentioned, I've been studying high-performing IT organizations for 14 years now. And the biggest surprise is it, this journey has taken me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. And among this community, I don't need to convince you of that. The challenge really becomes how do we as a community convince other people who don't see that yet? Um, and you know, when I say I really love being at this conference, why is that? And I think it can be, can be boiled down into this quote right here. You are only as smart as the average of the top five people you associate with, right? And so you know, when you are in this, I think you like me, right? If, you know, in these three days, you feel like you are surrounded by not only kindred spirits, but people you're learning from. And so uh, you know, I think you know, the goal is you know, how to expand that tribe. So um, the purpose of this presentation is not to talk about you know, what is DevOps, right? Instead, you know, how do you get other people to uh, join the DevOps movement, right? Because we need their help. Uh, and what I want to do is share with you kind of one of the most valuable life lessons I've learned in my journey, which is actually sales training. And so I think if the goal is to uh, expand the tribe, how do we influence other people, build the coalition so that we can make it actually so, right? Because we can't necessarily do it by ourselves. So uh, what I want to do in the next 44 minutes is uh, you know, share with you why I think DevOps is so important. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, but I want to share with you, you know, the way I sh uh, tell the story and then deconstruct in terms of why I tell it this way. Um, show others how do we bring this to bear so other people can have their own DevOps moments. I'll share with you kind of my aha moment that made me realize why DevOps was what I've been looking for for uh, so many years. Um, we'll talk about what coalitions can we mobilize, how can we get them to care, um, and then walk through the value selling process. So when you hear about selling, don't think about slippery salespeople, you know, making big promises. Think about, you know, how do we get the mirror neurons to fire in someone else? How do we get them to see something that they don't see right now? And ultimately, you know, embark upon a journey where at the end, you know, the ideal reaction is thank you, right? Thank you so much for helping me see something I didn't see and achieving something together that we couldn't have done without each other. And then I want to share with you some of the, my top lessons learning, um, my top lessons learned, you know, while trying to influence people in my own DevOps moral crusade. So um, I want to share with you kind of the, uh, my depiction of the downward spiral that happens in every IT organization, which means, you know, which, uh, which is essentially the first 170 pages of the Phoenix Project. You know, when we first started first seeing this in 2007, I mean, it was this inexorable force that almost preordained failure. So, you know, it can always be told in two acts. The first is always begins in operations. And I think, you know, as an operations community primarily, you know, our goal, is in operations is to deliver value to the customer, and the bane of our existence is caused by fragile artifacts. The reason why we call them fragile is because every time we touch it, it blows up, causes a catastrophic outage, catastrophic amount of unplanned work, right? Um, and the, when you ask the question, where do you find fragile artifacts, it's typically in one of two places. It's in the most critical revenue generator of the company, in other words, the most critical operations, or it's the most critical project, right? Like the, pro the Phoenix project, the most critical project that must complete in order to catch up with the competition. And when you find fragile artifacts there in the most critical project or operation, something inevitable occurs, which is that the organization ceases to become able to meet the promises it makes to the outside world. And so the Phoenix Project was actually specifically designed to show that you know, it's the capabilities we promise to customers, whether it's a feature or some sort of capability, earnings per share estimates that we promise Wall Street, or uh, whether it's the you know, ability to show analysts that we have a viable strategy and can execute. All those three things were actually you know, f you know, fitted into uh, the first 170 pages of Phoenix project. And I can say as a married person, you know, with some certainty here, right, the inevitable outcome when we break promises to someone else is that we make even bigger promises, you know, that even more audacious promises that we're even less likely to hit in the future, right? That happens between human beings, happens in personal relationships, but it also happens inside organizations as well, right? Uh, and so, you know, this happens in organizations. The problem is, you know, who's making those promises? It's these people, you know, the product managers, you know, the art majors, creative writing majors, who may not have the best idea of what technology can and can't do, right? And now we enter the other side of the tribe, right? Are the developers, uh, the developers who, as a um, you know, community, what we see are urgent date-driven projects put into the queue where a commitment has already been made to the market, right? The date has been set, the newspaper ads are, you know, set to go. Um, and so we as a development community, we have to cut every corner that can be cut in order to make the date, right? You know, security testing, capacity testing, deployment, manageability, all that, you know, gets jettisoned in order to uh, mark it as a feature complete release candidate. And that's when we start to accrue technical debt, right? And that, you know, Ward Cunningham said it best 15 years ago, Technical debt is what we feel the next time we try to make a change, right? And so that's not true just for development, but operations as well. So here's, you know, technical debt as I've envisioned it. You know, it's uh, the accumulation of all the crap 
that, we, uh, that cruise in a data center over decades, each time made with the promise that um, you know, we're going to fix it when we have a little bit more time, right? <laughs> um, and so that, of course, never happened. So this, although bad, you know, turns into this, right? So, um, and I think this is what really causes the, you know, the decade-long inter-tribal warfare between development and ops, right? You know, here's our developer. Uh, you know, they've read Jez Hummel's book, and yet, you know, they still commit code into production. They go home, they high-five each other in the parking lot, buy each other rounds of shots of tequila at the bar, not realizing they set the entire data center on fire for an entire weekend, right? So, at this point, no one's achieving their goals. Features are taking longer to get to market. Deployments are taking longer. Um, you know, we have an ever-increasing number of Cep1 outages, and operations becomes increasingly mired in technical debt, powerless to uh, change the outcomes. And this is where sometimes downstream, whether it's test or ops or information security, we feel like uh, we are powerless to change the outcomes, that we are trapped in a system that preordains failure. This is a little um, test. Does, does this story resonate with anybody? <laughs> Some? Right. How many people here have a friend who can resonate with some elements of this story? <laughs> right. Right. Good. Right. So and essentially, that is the Phoenix Project, you know, the first 170 pages. And this happens everywhere. So, um, you know, Act 3, there must be a better way. And so it's not just the unicorns, right? The unicorns can have shown us. The reason why I think DevOps is so important is that we, they have shown that you can break this core chronic conflict. You can deliver more features quickly to market while preserving world-class availability, stability, and uh, security, right? Um, and it's not just the unicorns. Um, you know, it's, you know, horses as well. So, um, you know, it's financial services, it's uh, retailing, I wish that, uh, we, it's uh, higher education, it's governments, it's the Department of Homeland Security. And, and so the question is why? Why are these, you know, organizations, many of them who are associated with a reputation of being late adopters of technology, why would they be adopting something as risky and radical as DevOps? And I think the reason is, is that um, the value of DevOps is far higher than we ever thought. So, um, so I want to share with you uh, some, well, actually, I'll, I'll touch on this later. Um, so let me share with you kind of my DevOps aha moment. It happened in 2007 uh, with this gentleman. This guy's name is uh, Eric Passmore. Uh, he was the uh, Senior Vice President of Global Engineering at AOL. Uh, who eventually became the CTO, and now he's at uh, MSN. But you know, he, inside the AOL IT operations organization, he had a very interesting reputation. He was known as that bleep, bleep, bleep Eric Passmore, right? Uh, he had about 1,300 developers working for him. But he had a reputation of essentially shutting down every operational improvement initiative there was, right? In other words, you didn't even have to sort of finish your idea right, before he would say no, right? In fact, if, you know, he had a reputation of, if he got wind of some sort of, you know, uh, you know configuration management project or some sort of uh, process improvement initiative, you know, he had a reputation of killing those, you know, just maybe out of malice, right? But essentially, um, we actually had a workshop with uh, the ops group there and Eric Passmore, right? And I want to share with you what his aha moment was. Uh, which I made him repeat five times until I understood what it was. Because for me, it was, it was probably the missing piece of the puzzle that made me realize, you know, DevOps is exactly what we're looking for. So I want to walk through um, a PowerPoint slide, which I have found to, to be the most useful selling vehicle in terms of getting other people to say, hey, DevOps is not just for you. It might actually be relevant for me. So I'm going to retell the uh, downward spiral story. But instead of using pictures, I'm going to use uh, bullet points, right? By the way, what is the viral, uh, what is the ultimate viral mechanism inside of most organizations in large enterprises? PowerPoint, right? So let's use the tool that enterprises use, PowerPoint slides. So essentially, you walk through this group of bullet points. Fragile, fragile application are prone to failure. It takes a long time to figure out what changed, right? Uh, what bit got flipped. So therefore, oh, and, and often, you know, the first person to recognize that we have a service impairment or outage is a salesperson or a um, or the customer, right? Instead of an internal production control or production uh, monitoring thing. Uh, and so that means it takes too long to, to restore service, too much unplanned work and firefighting, and that means planned project work can't complete. And so often, uh, you know, frustrated customers are leaving despite the fact that we spent $800 million on the acquisition, and then our market share goes down, and now the business starts missing Wall Street commitments, and now the business starts making even larger promises to Wall Street. So now we begin on the second column. More urgent date-driven projects put into the queue, more fragile code gets put into production, 
releases start taking longer. And then the, usually the business survival instinct is to do painful things less frequently, right? We tend to lengthen the release intervals, right? Do them less frequently, which means the failures become even bigger, which means that we need our most senior ops and developers, you know, uh, working all the time to uh, fix the issues. And it means that we have this ever-increasing backlog of infrastructure projects, you know, that could really, that we know could fix the problem, they'll never get done, right? So what Eric Passmore's aha moment was, was this. Essentially, he said, holy cow, because the operations group took nine months to upgrade the Linux kernel from 2.4 to 2.6, it was like a code freeze for nine months. In other words, we had code that needed multi-threading support. And because the ops guys took so long to upgrade you know, the production uh, images, right, it, was like, it was like a code freeze. Right? And because we did that, we couldn't, you know, we lost these customer deals. And because of that, we also had to take on these other projects that, you know, had to, that brought on less healthy revenue. So he said, that's not an operations problem. That's not even a development problem. That is my boss's boss's biggest problem. So in other words, the Eric's aha moment was that, you know, the downstream operations problems were actually his biggest problem. It was the blockage in the flow. And so after that moment, I mean, Eric Passmore's reputation changed from, you know, that bleep, bleep, bleep Eric Passmore to that, Ameri uh, that amazing Eric Passmore. He became like a force of nature that drove more operations improvement projects, you know, um, you know over the series of, you know, uh, the, the remainder of the year. In fact, you know, we re reduced the deployment time of the AOL.com homepage from six hours to 45 minutes because he said it's insane that our test people to initiate a deployment are putting war files in a network share and then opening up a ticket. Instead, the QA people volunteered, or were volunteered, to, uh, you know, instead of putting war files, put in deployable package files, right? And so the ops people wouldn't have to pick through the poo for the peanuts, right? They had something that was instantly deployable. So, so I think, you know, for me, that was a huge aha moment because this is how we sell DevOps to the engineering function, right? And we heard a little bit about this uh, in John Esser's talk. Uh, how am I doing here so far? Is this uh, interesting? Yeah? Okay. Um, and by the way, uh, these slides are available on SlideShare as well. So, uh, and I would actually print this out, <laughs> right? And whenever you're having a talk about DevOps, you know, I find that this is actually a very effective vehicle, you know, to actually get people to begin a conversation that may not have happened before. All right, so, um, so just to talk about the selling process. This guy is uh, named Dr. Bill Lanton. He was actually employee number 22 at Intel. He was, he was one of our board members. And uh, he'll tell stories like, yeah, as employee number 22, the person who hired him was Andy Grove. And he has this amazing story about being picked up at the Phoenix airport by Andy Grove in a, Vo in a Volkswagen Rabbit, right? <laughs> and, but you know, he had a reputation in his career of being the most charming salesperson, right? And it w the, the connotation wasn't that he was slippery or that he was slick. Instead, you know, he had this certain Columbo-like demeanor, right, that would help people sort of get their own aha moments. And the uh, ideal, and the reaction was typically, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Latin, right? And so um, let me share with you kind of what I learned from him. So one of the most widely used selling models is called the value settling model. And there are four steps, and I'll go through each one uh, in more detail. The four stages of value selling is problem. In other words, uh, you know, you can't have a solution until you actually uh, you get someone to admit they have a problem. But it's more than that, right? We need them to articulate and confirm that it's a significant problem, right? In other words, are they just bitching? Or are they, is this a problem that they're actually genuinely willing to work together to solve? After that, you know, uh, going, you know, getting them to verbalize solution and then confirming value. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure that we never fool ourselves that someone's just being nice to us, right? We want if we follow the integrity of the process, right, our, we will have, at the end, a tremendous amount of assurance that we have something substantive, you know, in common, in terms of values and direction, and the reaction that we'll get at the, at the ideal, at the end, is thank you. So let's go through each one of these. So problem statement. So here's some lines that you can use, right? And I think uh, um, you know, with almost any skill, you know, uh, if it doesn't come naturally, it can't come naturally in the beginning, so you fake it until you make it. So here are some lines you can use you know, to start, you know, at least move through this process. To talk about problems, right? When you talk to someone in dev or prod, you know, dev or test or product owners or UX, and I'm going to go through kind of all the use cases about potential value statements that we can uh, be offering them. You know, a good opening question is, what's the difference for you between a good day and a bad day? Right? In fact, this is actually one of my favorite questions, right? The more common one is like, what keeps you up at night? 
right? But uh, in fact, in the Phoenix project, we use this line, you know, describe a good day for me and describe a bad day, right? And you know, you're going to get a tremendous amount of depth of, uh, you know, one, we'll understand what they like in terms of a good day and what a bad day feels like. Um, the second stage is significance, right? Um, we never want to fool ourselves that just because we heard what we want to hear, right, that's actually genuinely important to them. So my favorite um, line for this is, you know, okay, when that happens, when you have a bad day, does anyone else care? Does your boss care, right? Uh, or is this just your own personal problem? Um, my favorite way to sort of uh, understand this is on a scale of one to 10, how big of a problem is this? You know, one is it's trivial, it's even you're embarrassed that you even mentioned it. 10 is it is the biggest problem I have, and more importantly, it's the most important problem that my boss has and my boss's boss has, right? And when, when they say something like that, that means we're sitting on a genuinely large business problem, right? In other words, uh, it means it's not gonna be one person thanking us at the end, it might be their boss's boss's boss thanking us, right? And ultimately, that's kind of uh, you know, how projects get uh, funded and certainly uh, how projects get rewarded. Another one that I dislike is, uh, so what, right? You know, oh, when deployments fail, it blows up, so what, <laughs> right? Well, then I have to mobilize three guys, so what? Well, it's because we have, you know, it takes three days to fix, so what? Well, it's because now we're gonna be late on our next deliverable. And it's, uh, the more you ask, so what, by the way, you know, it actually tends to look more like a boss's boss's problem, right? Um, uh, in the current reality tree by, uh, in the theory of constraints, right? You know, the more you ask, so what? Typically, it becomes more of a business problem. Am I am I making sense? Okay. So significance. Uh, after that is solution, right? Um, you know, in the ideal, right? Um, you know, we never want to uh, you know give someone. It is far preferable to have someone actually verbalize what they think the solution is, right? Than uh, you know us having to tell them. So again, one of my favorite lines is, "Gosh, you're right. That is a big problem. You know, I, I agree. I see that too. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you do, right? You know, um, or if you were king or queen for the year, you know, uh, what would you do to make this go away, right? And get them to actually verbalize and reason through, uh, you know, what their vision of success is." Right? Um, and of course, this can be collaborative, but in the ideal, right, uh, it is far preferable to get someone else to verbalize you know, the solution that you're thinking of in your head, right? because it can take credit, they can take more credit in the idea. And then value. Um, you know, and I think this is, you know, this gives us more assurance and more ammo at the end, right? You know, what's in it for you, right? Um, uh, we can ask in six months, you know, if we can wave that magic wand again and everything you verbalized is now in reality, you know, what does life look like for you, right? Um, or what's in it for you? And, and often the, uh, the, what we're trying to get people to verbalize is, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have to have my people work all weekend, all the time. You know, I can have better work-life balance. I don't have so many people quitting on me, right? We'll score higher on the cultural, you know, uh, HR scores or whatever, right? And, and often, you know, when we ask what's in it for you, they're actually, you know, they'll verbalize something personal to them, right? Which is, you know, I, I'll have more fun in my job, we'll get to do more innovative things, right? Uh, my employ my, uh, the people on my team will be happier. So, um, the four stages, get people to verbalize problems, you know, establish the significance of it, um, you know, get them to articulate solution and value. And the whole purpose of this is that we never embark on something prematurely, right? Because if we go through this and we, you know, we, at the end, we're like, gosh, it does sound like a really worthy problem and uh, we have a genuine shared vision of what to do, it should give us confidence that we're not wasting anyone's time, right? So um, that's the value selling process. And I have found that this PowerPoint slide is often a good icebreaker, <laughs> right? Because, um, and, and the reason is this. You know, I remember uh, having a meeting with executives, right? Arrogant, arrogant executives. You know, in the beginning, he's like, yeah, what, why are you here? Um, and in this case, it was Eric Passmore's boss. And I'm like, hey, you know, there's a certain symptomology we observed, and, I'm just, uh, and I just want to get your thoughts on it. And I walked through this, and by the end of the you know, 90 seconds it took to walk through this, the body language changed from like, you know, folded arms, you know, leaning back to leaning forward with bags underneath his eyes, right? <laughs> and it's just, it's, it was, you know, I think it's just sort of an effective way to land a punch, right? Uh, and it's not about them, of course. And then, you know, the reaction was like, are you saying that you have some ideas on how to break this you know, <laughs> break this loop? I'm like, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Anyway, so um, it's a great tool to use. Um, so, uh, so that's the selling pattern. So the question is, 
who do we want to sell to, right? Who do we want to influence? What is, who are the members of the coalition that we need to mobilize, right, in order to make it so, right? To put DevOps practices into place so we can get these amazing outcomes that, that we've heard so many times in the last two days. So the first one is engineering. And I want to share with you a story of uh, Jez Humble, who will be speaking in uh, 30 minutes. So uh, he and I were sitting together, and actually we've been working together on the DevOps cookbook. Uh, and you know, we're talking about you know continuous delivery and uh, you know all the you know funny, stupid things that happen when you don't have continuous delivery practice in place. And I'm laughing and laughing and laughing, and then I sort of stop. I'm like, holy crap! Wait a minute. I made that mistake. In fact, <laughs> I made that mistake in 2006 when I was at Tripwire. Right? There was a certain symptomology right that we went through, which is. Um, we, had, we weren't using continuous integration, and the problem was that we would put all code integration um, to the end of the project. In other words, all the developers were working on private branches, and then we reserved one week to merge the code, right, and so we could ship it next week. And what we found is over time that the integration t took uh, one week, two weeks, four, <laughs> four weeks, and it became so painful, right, that we, as a management team, decided, uh, our VP of engineering said, the releases are so painful, we should ship products less often. And all of us nodded and said, yes, that's a good idea, right? Because we want to amortize the cost of deployments. <laughs> and so the reason why my reaction is like, oh, is because at the time it made total sense, right? And, you know, in the and so suddenly our release cadence went from once every nine months to once every year and a half, right? So, um, so sometimes what seems obvious is not obvious to other people, right? Um, and, you know, the... When you're talking to someone who's uh, leading an engineering team, you know, to be able to explain this phenomenon, right? Uh, you know, the, I, the, the goal is to trigger that sort of response. All right, so that's one. Um, of course, the answer is continuous integration, which is a prerequisite for continuous delivery, which of course is a prerequisite for DevOps. So that's my, hopefully this gives you some ideas in terms of how to recruit people on the engineering side of the, uh, the development side. How about product managers? And um, I have actually found user experience people to be an amazing, um, powerful ally in my journey. And so here's why. I was having a, uh, a friend of mine, he's an engineer in the HP, um, in the cloud engineering division. And um, one of the uh, problems they were having, in fact, no, it wasn't him, it was another friend. Um, but they were having a problem where essentially they had very long release cycles. They were shipping new releases once every year, once every year and a half. And the problem was as a product manager, as a UX person, it meant that the feature prioritization process became very political. And so it was actually a routine event that, um, you know, in order to get your feature into the next release, it had to go up four or five levels of management, right? There was a CEO of a multi-billion dollar a year company routinely reviewing what feature goes into what release, right? And for a UX person, that's extremely frustrating because all they want to do is move a button, you know, two inches to the left, and they have to wait two years, right? <laughs> and there's a certain sense of futility you have, right? When, uh, you know, even small changes take a very, very long time, right? Um, so, you know, it turns out to not have that conversation with them and have, to have them say, it's absurd, right? Because, you know, we are doing feature planning for fiscal year 2022, <laughs> right? Who knows what the world is going to look like in 2022? You know, we need to be talking about what, you know, what features get into the release next month. So, product management and uh, UX people are also power, uh, very uh, big recipients of what happens when you have fast flow uh, that's associated with uh, DevOps. Information security. Um, by the way, so my journey, I guess, in technology started when I wrote a tool called Tripwire back in 1992. And so I would say, you know, my primary areas of passion are, you know, before it was operations, was information security. And I think it's, how many people here would say that uh, you've actually personally observed information security people freaking out when they hear about DevOps? <laughs> yeah, so. Here's how can we have a conversation with them to, you know, get over their, uh, um, you know, their deep-seated fear of, you know, high fast deploy rates, and you know, especially when we talk about, you know, separation of duty not existing, and maybe even the absence of change approval processes. So uh, uh, there's a gentleman named Josh Corman. Oh, actually, I want to tell you Josh Corman's story before I uh, go on. 
Josh Corman did a study of burnout in information security. Um, and what he found was that the rates of burnout in InfoSec was off the charts. It was higher than first responders, higher than uh, physicians in the ER. It was even higher than people doing multiple tours of duty during wartime in the military service. Right? Um, and I think if you were to repeat the study in IT operations, it would be just as high. Right? Because you know, what we have in common is we are both stuck downstream. Right? And we have to live with the daily consequences of uh, you know, decisions made way upstream. Right, which creates technical debt that we have to live with, right? And so maybe that's one thing that you know, uh, you know we and information security have in common, right? Is uh, we're very often, you know, we have to deal with people who are burned out. By the way, incidentally, what are the top three signs of burnout? Fatigue. Certainly, uh, there's three of them. One is fatigue. The second one is cynicism, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, when you have to deal with like you know, uh, you know. Uh, having to clean up the mess of others for a decade, right? You become very cynical, right? Especially when you're powerless to change the outcomes. Um, and the third is illusions of self-efficacy, right? In other words, we think that we're actually better than we are, right? So in the Phoenix Project, um, you know, I guess the person who might be closest to that might be Brent, right? You know, uh, Brent always has to save the day, right? And that's the, he's the only person who can save the day, right? And now, they, that may or may not be true, but often that's reinforced by, you know, illusions of self-efficacy. All right. Um, so I want to share with you, I think, one of the most amazing presentations uh, that I've heard uh, for information security and DevOps. And I think this presentation is the equivalent of the um, 10 deploys a day, you know, all spa Hammond presentation. It was given by Justin Collins, Neil Matal, and Alex Smolin from Twitter. So they gave this presentation at the AppSec USA conference in 2012, and it was an amazing story. Essentially, they were telling the tale of having to parachute into Twitter um, after the uh, Barack Obama account was hacked, right? And essentially, they, they got an FTC injunction that said, thou shalt have an information security program for the next 25 years, <laughs> right? And they had to deal with, you know, they had to, you know, deal with you know, tons of technical debt, right? Um, and an absence of any sort of effective security testing program. And what they talked about was, one of the remarkable things they talked about was uh, something called Breakman. Breakman is a static code analysis tool that runs um, as part of the continuous delivery process and actually runs you know, alongside the Jenkins instance. Uh, and it will actually scan their code, uh, scan developers' code, not only every time they hit commit, it can run in a mode where it runs every time a developer hits save. Right? In other words, they show this demo, right? Of uh, and uh, you know, they'll, Justin Collins will say over and over, "That's not the way it usually gets used." But right, they had this demo where you know, a developer you know hits code, hits uh, Control S, right, and will say they get an email saying, "Hey, we just noticed that you uh, we found some code that could inject a potential SQL injection vulnerability. Here's how to you know click here to learn how to fix it, right?" And the instant it does, uh, the instant the developer sort of commits, uh, saves the code to fix it. They get another email saying, congratulations, right? Uh, thank you so much for fixing the code. Could you please rate our advice on a scale of one to five stars? Anyway, so that can only happen you know, when you have continuous delivery in place, right? And I think for that, you know, what that means for an information security practitioner is that InfoSec is genuinely integrated into the daily work of development and operations, right? So that means, uh, you know, how would they verbalize it? For the first time, we actually get to test the code before, you know, you know before two days before it goes into production, right? Uh, it means that we can reduce the time from found to fix. Um, you know, the whole notion of reserving 20% of your dev cycles and op cycles to paying down technical debt, one of the biggest beneficiaries is information security. Um, you know, any place where you can enforce consistency of the code and the environment, you know, like you know, when we have configuration management in place and build in audibility, I mean, those are things that security people love to hear. So, you know, just walking through, uh, I think, a success story like that, you know, ideally, information security should be our best friend, right? I mean, because we want the same outcomes. You can't be available if you're being hacked all the time, right? So, uh, you know, I think helping connect the dots for information security will earn you a new best friend. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually, after seeing John's presentation yesterday, um, I want to add one more, which is, you know, if we're talking about the coalition, building a coalition, you know, that spans the entire value stream, product owners, uh, dev, test, ops, information security, you know, let's throw one more in. You know, salespeople, right? Often these are the people who are, you know, they have their own objectives, but they can be a phenomenal source of bringing resources to bear to help, uh, you know, driving pilots through. They're also a great, you know, place for, you know, 
intelligence, right? In other words, you know, who also cares about this, right? They have to spend all their time getting the lay of the land to find champions. You know, um, and it sounds very much like John very much benefited from, uh, with a fabulous relationship with, uh, with the sales force. So I would submit to you that uh, that's uh, a constituency that might be on your list as well. Um, before I keep going, um, how am I doing here? Is this uh, useful? Okay, yeah, nice. <laughs> all right, good. Um, so in this value selling process, you know, we're problem, solution, uh, problem, significant, solution, value. So the next stage usually is like objection handling, right? In other words, yeah, but, you know, we're not Amazon, we're not Google, right? This doesn't apply to us, right? Um, so let me share with you kind of, you know, let's continue the selling process. Uh, the first one is actually being able to articula you know, articulate what the ideal future reality looks like. In other words, you know, uh, when they articulate kind of what their magic wand wish is, um, you know, we should be able to reinforce that you know, by saying, yeah, that's exactly what, in fact, here's a trajectory of things that could happen, right, that takes us from this horrible state that we're in to this beautiful state that we want to be in. By the way, I love this quote. Telling someone else about all their problems without giving them a solution is mean, right? So we don't really want to have, you know, we want to close, you know, the, our discussions with them, you know, with you know, telling about what the happy state looks like and how to get there. And so, you know, um, this essentially is the flattened list of the downward spiral, the, the two column thing, right? So it means that, you know, predict, installs are predictable. They rarely have a cascading effect. We have less downtime. Customers rarely leave. We hit our 20% growth target. Uh, we're hitting the earnings target and we're tackling even more projects and we're doing even better than ever, right? Walking them through that narrative, I think, uh, you know, it also helps kind of build their confidence in the future state. An objection that you might hear, though, is like, yeah, yeah, but it can't happen here, right? So this is where we bring to bear like, things like benchmarking. One of the things that uh, has been one of the most fun things to do over the last 15 years is broad cross-population studies. So uh, there was a benchmark that uh, actually Jez Humble and I worked on with uh, another great configuration man management vendor. And what we found after benchmarking 4,200 organizations was that high performers exist and they are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers, right? We know that organizations who are putting DevOps practices into place, they're far more agile. They're doing 30 times more frequent code deployments and they can complete them 8,000 times more quickly. In other words, how quickly can they go from code committed to test environment available, to test set up, test run, Deployment started, deployment finished, successfully running in production. We know that high performers can do this in minutes or hours, whereas lower performers can do it, you know, would require weeks, months, or quarters, right? Often they're waiting for environments, right? We want a dev environment, and we, but we have to wait 42 weeks. Right, after that, um, so not only are they doing more work, but they're getting far better outcomes. Uh, when they do a production deploy, or production change, they're twice as likely to succeed. In other words, a change success rate is twice as high, and when Murphy, you know, um, you know, comes into the play and a step one outage occurs, they can fix it 12 times faster, right? And in my mind, this is such, such decisive evidence from when we got this finding, right? Because it says, they gave us concrete evidence that you can actually be more agile and be more reliable at the same time, right? So the reason why we do stuff like this is, is to give proof points, right? To show that it's not something just conjured up in my head, right? You know, we know that, you know, 4,200 organizations, you know, validate, uh, validate this. Um, also, by the way, when to bring bear was like you know, when we have to fund that chef project. We also know that there are two things that every high performer does that none of the low performers do. Right? There, every high performer answered yes to these two questions. We check in production environment, all production artifacts into version control, just like John Esser said. Right? You know, we chefize those boxes and we put it into version control so we can recreate the production environment when we need to. Secondly, we have an automated process to deploy code and an automated way to create environments available on demand. It means every, if you answered yes to those two questions, 99% chance you're a high performer. If you answered no to either, 99% chance, chance you're not a high performer. So, you know, that's again what the data says. Um, let me also share with you kind of what we've learned about, you know, the transformation from low to high. Uh, one of my favorite, my, the favorite book that I would recommend to anybody is The Goal. The, how many people here have read The Goal? 
some, uh, like a third of you. If you haven't read this book, I would recommend it to anybody. It'd be the first one that I put on the list. It was a novel that was written in the 1980s by Dr. Eliyahu Goldratt, um, and he, that book is credited for changing how an entire generation of business managers, how we thought about plant operations. And it was a novel about a plant manager, manufacturing plant manager, who had to fix his cost and due date issues in 90 days, otherwise they shut the plant down. And one of the most memorable quotes for me when I read this 15 years ago was, any improvement not made at the bottleneck is an illusion. In other words, any flow of work, right, you have one and only bottleneck. If you, and here, here was his proof point. If you improve something after the bottleneck, it will always be starved for work waiting for the bottleneck. <laughs> uh, if you improve something before the bottleneck, you know, it, the work will just pile up at the bottleneck. And so in general, you know, here's how we go from low to high. The first one is almost always environment creation. How quickly can we get you know, uh, an environment, especially for development? Secondly, how quickly, well, once you fix that, the bottleneck becomes how quickly can we get code into production? Third is then, how, if we can do that quickly, how quickly can we get a test set up and run? After that, it's usually, it's usually architecture. In other words, uh, every time we want to make a change, we have to let 15 other people know and convince them to let us make the change because everyone so is too afraid to make it because if we change one thing, it will blow up everything else. And then and after then, the, de the constraint becomes development and product owners. In other words, uh, how many good valid business hypotheses can we come up with that are worth building and testing, right? And that should be constrained only by development. And when you look at these high performers like Netflix, Etsy, and so forth, everyone is talking about developer productivity. And I think that really reinforces that where the constraint should be is development. It shouldn't be ops, shouldn't be test, certainly shouldn't be information security, right? And so we want to move the constraint all the way to the development thing. And so uh, I think one interpretation is that that's terrible, ops loses. On the other hand, it's like, no, now ops, we can get away from manual work and really help the organization win by making developers more productive. All right, so um, let me share with you a couple uh, last things. Um, Ops Rob, Rob Cummings, talked about this book. D he introduced me to this book last year at ChefConf. I think this is a phenomenal book. It really does show what are the prerequisites for innovative efforts uh, to succeed in large organizations, right? Organizations are designed to um, do operations, right? And innovations is not operations. And so the, that's the need for a dedicated team. I think anyone embarking on a DevOps project where you, everyone does say yes should read this book to really understand kind of how should the DevOps team be organized, right? So that we get protected from the mothership and we don't get constrained by all the existing you know, standards, policies, and, and rules. Um, let me share with you two more points and then uh, conclude. I think another objection is, okay, maybe all these other organizations could do it, but not here. One of the most exciting kind of case studies uh, that we found last year was this. It was from SAP. Darren Haig is the operations architect for SAP at SAP, right? In other words, they're delivering the SAP service <laughs> to internal SAP and the SAP customers. And he said by putting you know, DevOps principles into place, they were able to reduce lead time from code commit to running in production from nine months down to one week. And so I would submit to you that if you can do it with SAP, you can do it for anything. COBOL mainframe apps, WebSphere, you know, IIS.net, right? Because there's nothing more uh, designed to be unagile than SAP, right? So I would say, if we can't do it, <laughs> right, then there's something wrong with us. So out of pride, come on, let's try. Um, Am I perceived, uh, am I worried that sometimes DevOps is perceived as a fad? And at this point, no, right? Uh, you know, uh, I think the worst thing, you know, as I think Rob mentioned, right, the goal is, you know, how do we move DevOps so it's not just something that the crazy people are talking about. It's not just uh, some of the early adopters, but it's also, you know, the er early majority, right? Well, in order for us to win, we need DevOps to be embraced by the people who are not at ChefConf. And so, you know, uh, when you see DevOps being overly hyped, you know what, I would say, Get into that conversation. Don't poo-poo it, right? Instead say, hey, when someone asks about DevOps, say, gosh, you know what, I think it's great, and here's what I think we should be doing, right? Any, the more people who are talking about DevOps, right, is an opportunity for us to have a conversation. And, you know, I'm, I was, Stephen Fishman, a friend of mine, he said, <laughs> I compared the plight of DevOps to apartheid, right? Apartheid, the outcomes of apartheid were far worse than DevOps. I think DevOps is important, but it's not as bad as apartheid. It took 27 years, right, to get the early majority to say it's wrong, right? So, you know, if it takes longer than we want, right, maybe, um, 
maybe it will take seven years. Uh, hopefully it won't take much longer than that. But you know, I think the goal is to repeat it as often as it takes to as many people as it takes so that other people will say, gosh, that makes sense. And ideally, we take that to its logical continuation, which is we undertook this journey together, and thank you so much for the help. Um, and then one last thing that I'll just add just is before you ask someone to do something, something, it's always helpful to give relentlessly before that. You never want to be the person always asking for stuff, right? I found that if you give relentlessly, right, often they will volunteer to do it for you without even asking, right? So give before you get. Um, last lesson. One minute. I'm going, share, I'm going to share with you one last concept in two slides. Ari Bailoff, uh, I had written a book called The Visible Ops Handbook uh, in 2004, and he wrote a, uh, the forward to the second edition. And when I was asking for him for help in 2006, I was like, gosh, Ari, what do I need? To? So he was a CTO at VeriSign. He became the CTO of Yahoo. He now leads the global storage team at Google. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Why can't I get people to care about this thing that you know, eventually turned into this thing that we call DevOps? And I was expecting him to give me some sage advice. And instead, he said to me one of the most hurtful things I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I actually remember sort of tearing up listening to the simple sentence he uttered, and I was wrecked for weeks. What he said was, Gene, in 10 years, everybody will understand this. In the meantime, you just have to qualify better. Right? And I think the reason why I found it so hurtful was I expected him to say, you need to learn how to sell better, you need to do better measurements or something. But I think the, uh, essentially what Ari said was probably the wisest piece of advice I ever received, which is we can't be shrill and hysterical, right? For some people, it will sound like a moral crusade, and you can't change other people's morals, right? So, you know, know when uh, someone is not an early adopter and move on. And I think the other thing that the last piece of advice I would leave for you is have some indifference to outcome, right? It doesn't, you're going to have to talk to 100 people to find your five people who will say, that's the best idea I've ever heard. Thank you so much. So you just, uh, the, the person that Eric in the book, in the Phoenix Project, is modeled after is a guy named Doran Kojis. And he really embodies sort of the, my vision of like someone who really doesn't give a flip about what other people think. <laughs> and so, you know, as he's having these conversations, be like Eric in the book, be like Doran Kojis. You don't have to uh, convince them about your self-worth. If they don't believe, they don't believe, move on and go to the next person. So with that, um, uh, oh, books as a qualification device. You know, we made the first 170 pages of the Phoenix Project available for free. So if you go to the uh, uh, Phoenix, uh, you just Google Phoenix Project free excerpt, put in your email address, you get a PDF file back, give it to as many people as you can, because 5% of the people will come back and say, holy cow, you just described what's happening to us. Are you saying you have some ideas of how to replicate that here? When someone finishes the Phoenix project, it gives you some data. They spent six hours of their valuable time reading the book, right? And you don't need to sell them, right? Now we are immediately can jump into the solution domain. So uh, my genuine hope is that uh, you will find your coalitions inside your organizations. We just announced that we're doing the DevOps Enterprise Conference on October 21st to 23rd. Our goal is to have a conference only for horses, right? No unicorns allowed. You know, um, and the goal is to really create a different narrative, right? That DevOps is not just for Google, Amazon, Etsy, and so forth. It's about Macy's, Disney, Nordstrom, Target, and you know, we want to capture the stories of how they made it and build a community practice to show how to make it so. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'll catch you after Jez's talk. Thank you.